Hi Tristan, uh, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of A Studio of One's Own, which is a weekly online dialogue session that seeks to reach out to artists internationally and hear about um, their catching, uh, catching up on their creative changing routines now that um, they've having, they're having been confined to their home space. And Tristan Tai is actually a Singaporean artist whose research-based art often involves digital composting and an appropriation of imagery to examine the veracities of our history and the ways of which we socially construct knowledge in our image-saturated epoch. And he's also um, an artist who has taken part in our 2019 Artists in Residence program in DEC. So he is no stranger to, um, to DEC. So before we begin, hi Tristan, um, how are you doing this quarantine? And uh, I know you're from Singapore, but you're currently residing in Washington. So could you give us a little bit of an update on how you've been doing? Hi. Kimberly, um, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to be part of this uh, podcast or dialogue session. Um, all things considered, I mean, things has, has been going pretty fine. I've been mostly, you know, in quarantine like you have uh, guessed. Um, I have initially wanted to travel to Singapore during this summer uh. break, um, but it just got really, really complicated. And in fact, I had tickets booked to Bangkok to meet my parents there, and oh. uh, and and we already cancelled it a while ago. Um, you know, and and now being the situation, not only I would have to be quarantined for fourteen days if I travel to Singapore on return, right. if I get to return to United States where where now my home base is, it's also going to be really complicated. I don't know um, if the borders will be. Close or whatnot, mm -hmm. you know, like situation is always evolving. And and uh, a friend said, if you are going to travel, make sure you're comfortable to be stuck where you're going to be traveling. Yes, to. for sure. Yeah, so, so that's how how it is. Um, otherwise, you know, um, I have just been very much um, closer to nature. I kind of, I live on the Patuxent River, so. Uh, wow. When I'm uh, just hop on my kayak, go fishing, or just look at the water, there's occasional boxes, um, horseshoe crabs, and things like that around. So that has wow. been pretty good. Yeah, I tend to operate better in space and quiet. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I kind of uh, have been enjoying that. And, um, and just to clarify, um, I am nearer to, to Washington, D.C., and not the state of Washington, Seattle, where that, right. you know, where, where that really um, active Black Lives Matter product, mm -hmm. protests uh, are going on. So it's a bit um, quieter here, and, and I right. fought to be, to be on this part of Washington, <laughs> rather than Washington State, yeah. For sure. Wow, like, that sounds like a luxury that you know us as Singaporeans cannot really imagine you're having this access to nature and like the space that you have there um is it something that you have always it has always been a part of your daily routine or is it much more so now that you're not allowed to go out anymore that much you know uh absolutely like this is a change um for me um I I also teach at a college which is um, in the in the very southern deep of southern Maryland, mm. that that's why my house is kind of situated between um, Washington D.C. and the college itself. Before this pandemic started, we actually really liked going into city um, and thought of moving into the D.C. area, like smack mm. in the city, enjoy the restaurants, the mall, the shopping, so we can get out of trouble. <laughs> and fried Korean chicken, <laughs> but um, yes. and, guys, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's really nice to be further away from the city, especially in times of pandemic. Yeah. Uh, otherwise mm -hmm. we kind of really caught up with um, daily routine of, of um, you know, juggling with work and, and other things, but not really enjoying um, the nature that we have. Wow. Yeah. I see. So actually when you mentioned like you teaching in, a college is it currently uh all the lessons have been online and um have you guys been adapting to a whole new framework for that or are you 
is it slowly transitioning back to a physical kind of experience? So there is um, the plans for reopening are slowly unfolding. Mm. The college was closed in the middle of the previous semester in March, and, and we went from face to face to remote teaching from March to May. So right now we're discussing the options for reopening in August, but um, just like the rest of the economy, they are faced with yeah. a very tough decision of, um, you know, mm. reopening face to face to, to um, sustain financially or um, do they want to go um, remote again? So, but, you know, all, all things are kind of in the air right now. Yeah. I'm actually really interested how, um, you know, you see like the teaching because you yeah i assume you're teaching art right uh mm -hmm. some an art course so how do you think the education or the art experience of education in in the states differs from that of singapore well there are many there are several different kinds of um higher ed institutions in mm. united states and i think that is fundamentally different um, when, if you think about Singapore, there's uh, LaSalle, there's NTU, ADM, um, and, and those are, are um, if you compare it to the institutions in America, they are very um, distinct in the way that we have liberal art colleges, that's where I teach, where, mm. Students have double majors, sometimes triple majors. So a lot of my students are, say, environmental science major and an art major. You know, they, right. they have this. Combo. So they bring with them um, kind of a different set of knowledge mm -hmm. um, and challenges. You know, yes. they kind of have quite an interest in two fields as well. Um, and then there are also like fine art schools here, right. maybe names that. Singaporeans would be more familiar with like Maryland Institute of Contemporary Art, um, SVA in New York. And those operate more closely to the art programs we have in Singapore. So mm. uh, other than that, I, I would say it's really like how an artist operate their environment, their, their cultural backgrounds that influence the way they work and produce work. Right, so right. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think that's about what, what okay. Are. I see. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, so I would. I'm curious to know because I know that your work and your practice engages a lot with historical narratives, and um, I assume that a large part of the creative process is a lot of research, uh, behind it all. And I'm. I was wondering how this sudden shift to, uh, this stay home setting and being confined to your space has actually contributed more to this research process and if you have currently, during this time, have been creating or have engaged in any certain creation of new works? Yeah, so my last project, um, or the current project I'm working on is about um, deconstructing colonial history, in particular slavery mm. by the British Empire in, in the Southeast Asia region. Mm -hmm. um, so I work, with a lot of images from the archive and access is a huge problem, even though you think most archives are digitized now, but they do yeah. only give a small preview, like a <laughs> thumbnail. Um, oh, wow. You can't really work on that. And in order to get access to that, let's say the, uh, the, the Library of Congress here, if you want to access images in the archive, you have to be in the physical building Wow. to a digital image, um, you know, load on a computer. So, and, and with most institutions, it's like that as well. Otherwise, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's like in a best case scenario, you see a little thumbnail of the image. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you only see a listing, like a search result in text. It's like back to the old days when you're using right. Netscape <laughs> to do research, you know. Yeah, so, right. so in terms of active research, that has been a problem. Um, but, I, you know, I've been reading um, books and things, whatever I can access. And um, I was also trying to refine my 
print making, silk screen printing skills, trying to make larger um, photographs on fabric so that they can mm. hang like punka fans, like this uh, old style fans that were used by um, in, in early, uh, especially in India and South Asia, where you need a physical laborer to pull the fans to, for them to work. So I was looking into custom electronics and doing things like that. And I have everything in my studio, which is on the college. I have a dedicated studio space. I have my large format printer there. I have my wow. laser cutter there. And when we were told to go remote in March, we were basically said like, okay, you need to clear out by uh, like oh. tomorrow noon and um, wait for further instructions. And we were told that that temporary shutdown was for a two weeks um, mid semester break and we'll right. see how it evolved. And how it evolved was that we were not allowed to go back unless you have essential duty. Essentially it's uh, completely shut down. Oh no. Yeah, so, so that has been the, the process. So let's sort of work with what we have. On the, on the positive side, um, I've had a couple of um, new commissions actually coming from Singapore. And that, that is really exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a new commission looking at a cultural heritage site. Um, and unfortunately, I cannot share the work with you now, but it's going to go somewhere live um, online. It's an online presentation sometime in the mm. Yeah, so I, I was looking at the ideas of cultural ownership. Um, do we really own a national monument? Or do we own it as a memory or um, what, what do you mean by cultural ownership because this particular cultural heritage site I, I'm looking at Raffles Hotel okay. has never actually been owned by a Singapore by a Singaporean entity. Wow. It is declared as a national monument so there's certain laws around it to protect mm. it. So where do we go to navigate this um, kind of influences in our in our you know um, yeah. memory of our own identity in, in building our collective identity because um, a lot of imagery is being used to to create this cultural brand so where do we really stand on that right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. wow that sounds extremely exciting actually um, I want to get to that idea of an online presentation later but it mm -hmm. seems like you know the pandemic really brought about a, a sort of an interruption to your workflow it's really just like unlearning the whole processes of um of of creating and like having to readapt very quickly uh yeah but it's so actually how how do you think um this this interruption has has affected you in and the way you you kind of plan your time because like you know calendar events are no longer uh, are somewhat cancelled and we are no longer able to cat categorize and like establish an order to our time so does that affect you in, in as an artist you know having not much of a structure yeah i i have a mantra it's a new day new fight <laughs> I, 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 I would um call that to, to my wife every morning when, when she needs motivation too so that forces me to get out of bed uh yes. yeah it's really yes. easy to kind of uh, fall in a slum and just net netflix and chill <laughs> till you know late nights and and um but I, I try and make it a habit to uh get get off bed get out early and go through things so um I, I really do enjoy that kind of uh, time and space I have now. Right. Uh, I think I tend to operate better when, when it's quiet and I have some space. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, so sorry, Tristan. I think I can hear my, my echo in the background. <laughs> you okay. sound just like where I am. Okay, great. All right. So sorry about that. But yes, like... Um, so, you know, you mentioned that uh, this idea of cultural ownership, how does that differ in Singapore when culture is so, it's so unintangible, knowing that we, it, it's not really fully Chinese. We, we have a very colonial uh, embedded history 
And um, with the, with this idea of a multiracial culture, how does that play with the idea of Raffles Hotel, which is such a symbol of, you know, colonial power? Um, I think we are kind of a at a time where most of the people, uh, where there's a critical mass of people who are educated. I think we were, um, before that 10, 20 years ago, we might, most people might be under the impression that there is only this singular narrative. Mm. We only have images of that uh, singer that Sangnila Utama saw, right? Yes. That, that was how we were taught as history. Um, and now it's kind of a, a level playing field for, for everyone that it's, internet is so disruptive and everyone is educated um, and we mm -hmm. start to think more critically about things we are being told and things that we are being presented with, for example, mm -hmm. imagery. Um, and that's something that my art and research has always been about what, what we are presented with um, and how I can make, um, you know, more visible things that are not mm -hmm. so, um, not so direct and straightforwardly presented to us. So for your question yeah. for Raffles Hotel, um, how um, it plays a part with the cultural ownership. Um, they, they have been owned or managed by a French hotel group and then it, it's right now owned by the Qatari government. Um, mm -hmm. So the Middle Eastern essentially has uh, bought over, but very interestingly, it's a national monument and the laws do uh, require them, you know, to get permission and approval and inspection if they want to make certain changes. So somehow we have our government entity controlling the narrative to a certain sense still. Right. But if you want to think about physical and legal rights and ownership, um, it is, it is not really a property that, that is owned by Singaporeans. It might be in the intangible way that you are kind of uh, delineating. It's kind of a cultural memory or identity, something intangible, but uh, something really powerful that, that we mm. hold on to. So I think as um, we think about more of these issues, um, how, how our, uh, you know, thoughts and understanding as a society is evolving, like with the current um, mm -hmm. general election, there's so many interesting um, debates and conversations. And I, I think every election cycle that we've been seeing, the, the debates have get more and more robust and people are Definitely. less and less apathetic. So yes. I, I think it's a great sign um, where, where we are moving. Wow, yeah, it's like definitely a change and people, uh, seem to be restless about um, trying to fit to something that we are, have always been told, especially in our social studies books when you think of that. Um, but yeah, I, okay, so you know, you mentioned that your work will be broadcast and live as an online presentation. Um, I know you're a media artist, but your works often, when you think of when I think of the, the use of image in your work, it's not always digital. Uh, in fact, you represent them in very physical forms. And like your, your recent exhibition um, last year in DEC, you, you exhibited these like stamps, uh, exhibited your images in the form of rubber stamps, which I thought was very, very interesting. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about how important it is to you that an image is experienced physically. Sorry. I think with um, certain tactile objects and the environment that, that you create from an installation, even though they are two-dimensional images, um, mm -hmm. it's really important. Um, you know, one, one amazing thing about art is it propels you into this space that is sort of make-believe and wonderful and really um, what you present can be decontextualized away from the world. And that white cube mm. space is really somewhere where it just automatically make people um, interact with images differently. You tend to, it tends to hold people's attention a little longer. You can think of it as a 
someone walking voluntarily into a prison cell where they are trapped with <laughs> That's because you choose to go there, there's really nothing much you can do, right? Yes, I like that. Talking of the... gallery is taboo, it's forbidden. So <laughs> you shouldn't uh, do any other thing other than appreciate art and think critically or pretend to think critically. So. <laughs> I really like that, pretend to think critically, yes. It's like you're really being confronted with this space and it's not just mm -hmm. about the art, it's also that, that space that holds it. Yeah, like, so, um, you know, we see, segueing into the larger question about, you know, the art industry in a time of a pandemic, we see this extensive shift to the online platform um, and exhibitions, shows and plays are being digitized to fit the screen. So what are your thoughts on this rising trend as a media artist? And do you think it's, it, it will endure uh, even beyond the pandemic? And could it potentially be a replacement for the way we experience art? I think with uh, a lot of things moving to remote, like mm. many other applications and industries, uh, people are finding that there are lots of positive things about it and, and some negative things about it as well. I think in terms of art, um, a lot of small institutions now have level playing fields with yeah. bigger guys, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like this, programming that you guys are doing. I, I think it's so wonderful and excellent. Uh, that's a, a prime example um, of giving voices and visibility to a lesser, um, you know, to, to a group that that's not often have uh, as much attention as, as other arts group elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think that is great. Uh, it's really disruptive in that way. So, yeah. The ne negative uh, aspects, I don't think it ever will replace physical interaction. Um, you know, that's, yeah. that's just things such as a uh, scale of objects that overwhelms you. You need color and light to engulf you. So um, I, I don't think ever it will um, replace physical in-person exhibitions. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really curious about how in terms of the art market it will uh, change or affect it because I've been even before the pandemic hit um, commercial real estate had some really good years and now they are in a serious slum and galleries mm -hmm. are, were already folding in especially cities that's been gentrified in San Francisco when the you know tech companies came in a lot of uh, major galleries were displaced closed down or they moved to a kind of a remote model where they just handle uh, projects remotely kind of what uh, Chan Ham has moved to, uh, right? Um, right? So, so that, that's something to watch for. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's 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 actually true. Um, I didn't really think about that commercial side, but definitely, it's it's gonna be much much harder for them to to sell. Uh, you know, the experience of art, especially through an online platform. Um, but mm -hmm. I I mean I'm I'm wondering if you think you know this will fundamentally. Uh, shift the way art as, a, as an industry will continue to progress and in terms of like exhibitions um, that maybe take advantage of the virtual space as, uh, as, a, as a medium perhaps and is that something that you're open to explore? I think it will definitely uh, there will definitely be a continuance of online shows um, and with more people getting into it, I, I do think works will, the way mm. work and the, the style of works people present will change as well. Um, you know, making work specifically for the screen is, is quite different for making works on the wall. Yeah, so yes. at which point do an artist say, I, I will uh, change my working style or aesthetics just mm -hmm. to make a, a work um, to fit on the screen, you know, where am I compromising or um, am I going to change my aesthetics fully? Because making art is really, you have to be obsessed about something. You can't give, a, um, you can't give any mm -hmm. um, like half efforts, you know, you, you really have to, to give your all. Yeah. So, I, I don't think I am at that juncture yet to make 
things specifically for the screen. Although recently I've been in another <laughs> exhibition online, it's like a fundraiser for um, wow, yeah. Black Lives Matter movement called Defend slash Defund. And a uh, lot of artists have been, new media artists have been creating really interesting uh, works, um, photographs that, that are flashing or mm. if you think of GIFs, they are like more complex GIFs, you know. That sounds very interesting. So it's it's kind of like an art market online kind of thing? Yeah, um, it's by the New Media Caucus um, related to um, the College Art Association. So if you look that up, uh, Defend, Defund, um, you could see that marketplace. It's actually specifically they're selling it as um, downloads. So you could download ah. it, uh, $30 a piece, open edition. So it's something cool on your phone. Wow, that's, that's quite innovative. I mean, it's not something we, we, we would be, you know, usually think to sell, which is really interesting. Um, I, I, I'm really, oh yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. The, the access, you know, the access to the art product, which is often overly priced, is, is now a lot more democratic in that way. Definitely. It's like, you know, it's you. You put all this information that has been that is usually so uh, so protected online, and you realize that art is actually so accessible and should have been so accessible. I mean, that's what I think. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm. I was just um talking to Gwen recently. We were all talking about the elections. It's really anything that Singaporeans can speak about this these days, and uh, I think it's very apt to bring up your your work in from 2013, um, Euphoria of Utopia. Do you mind sharing a little bit about the work itself and maybe also later about how, you know, if you've been keeping up with the GE this year? Yeah. Let me just grab, grab my little piece. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to show the cat. Yes, it's... Oh, wow. wow. I've never seen it in real life. <laughs> Oh, it sits on a really uh, nice little kind of aluminum frame acetate platform where they are kind of placed. Yeah. Um, you know, almost like 58 of them or so. It, oh, I made one for every member of the parliament. Wow. <laughs> so that, you know, it's personalized. Each of them That's can be... very thoughtful. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's kind of like just a fun project. Um, you know, about all these different kind of handouts we, we always receive as, as Singaporeans and um, kind of make people think more critically about um, what these handouts mean. Um, in, in a way, it's all very, you know, we've been described as a nanny state and, and mm -hmm. giving a lollipop is something that a, a parent might give to a child or an adult might give to a child. So thinking of that in, in terms of where I'm moving. So it's right. a tongue-in-cheek kind of a project. Yeah, it is very cheeky and it's very, um, it, it really does make us think, you know, when we're handed candy, it's maybe patronizing. Um, but actually, how do you feel about being away in, you know, during the, while the election's going on at home? Like, does that, does it affect you in any way? I think Not really. technology, it's uh, really accessible. You can watch live streams of, um, you know, interviews going on in the white decks of walkabouts and things like that. So oh. I, I've been inundated on my social feed. So I've been following here and there. Um, I think that's the great part. Um, I think even the pandemic, there isn't any rallies or whatnot. So yes, it hasn't been, been much of a of a difference yeah so, so it has been pretty good in that way i see well you, you know the idea of this candies right like i think i think this general election specifically there is there's almost like a, a widespread awareness of of these tactics just like giving out candy and i and i'm, I'm curious to know if you think that this this work is still applicable today because I think th there can this candy giving tactics have been working for the PAP for a very long time and um you know you mentioned that you're kind of like up to date and what, what do you think I mean I don't want to get too political but what do you think the the current uh at political atmosphere is you know from where you are 
I, I don't know if uh, I have a you know very good understanding of it. Um, I've only from what my perceptions are only shaped by what I've seen on mm -hmm. Facebook and YouTube, and that has been mitigated by whatever algorithms of who my friends are, yes. what I'm creating, <laughs> so on. So as an artist, uh, I as an artist working in in this this arena, I, I'm very uh, uh, very, very, very conscious of, of you know how, how my perceptions have been formed. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, with regards to the artwork, um, I, I would say yes. We, we definitely need to think about um, reflect on what we have been given. Um, mm -hmm. How how is that kind of evidence of how we are going to be uh, moving forward, mm -hmm. right? And, and is it a carrot and stick scenario? Is is the <laughs> can be carrot? You, you know, yeah. I think a lot of uh, other the opposing political parties have been trying to play, um, have been trying to shape their their kind of uh, philosophy in that angle as well. I was uh, watching Workers Party's uh, live stream yesterday, and they were saying. Um, how they were going to manage the Sengkang GRC. Yeah. No matter who you vote for, we will uh, make sure we take care of everyone. Everyone! <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was kind of uh, the, the main, main uh, message they were saying. Uh, and I was thinking, um, if I, I'm the politician, would I really want to say that? Is that incent uh, giving an incentive to people to not vote for me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like okay, if I'm a voter, uh, if I want to vote for the ruling party, still, um, you know, I and if they don't win, I will not be penalized. You know, there will be right. no, uh, no, no action of, of being penalized if the the opposing party wins. So, um, of, of course, the vote is supposed to be confidential. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, these are some very interesting dynamics about uh, the kind of reactions um, you see from from opposing parties um, with this kind of handout culture that we have yes. which i'm appreciated i, I think <laughs> um, of course more, more can be done if we have uh, such great gdp numbers but well all this is before the pandemic um, all the great numbers and years we have i i think we are in a totally a uh, different situation now. We don't know how this virus is going to, how bad the recession is going to be. So it's going to be a mm -hmm. tough spot. Whoever whoever is uh, going to be to have to manage the country and have the responsibility of taking care of the economy. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's it's very it's definitely a new spirit. Uh, every everything is so accessible online now i remember in the past when like two rallies would be on the same day you really just have to pick but now you know you you can watch it while you're just right before bed everything it's like this whole system of like voting and politics has changed um but regardless i think singapore is doing a a pretty decent job just taking making sure that we're all taken care of um how has how is the you know the political atmosphere been in the states. I know that there are, there are state elections going on as well, and um, it's a completely different situation there, especially with handling the handling of the the coronavirus. Uh, as as a Singaporean, do you feel like you you have to constantly straddle between these two these two places, especially with regards of you know your personal identity? Well. Um... I, I think I have always been, I, I don't have this problem of um, like a split identity. I've always viewed being a Singaporean means kind of being a global citizen. Mm. Um, and uh, the me being in, in the States, I, I'm an alien resident. That's what my mm -hmm. official status is, you know, green card holder, alien resident. And um, I see the politics here from a third party, an outsider point of view, because I have no right to vote here. Yeah. Um, the, the situation here is, of course, uh, you know, very much now fueled by uh, Black Lives Matter problems. Um, there, there is a pretty 
strong population of uh, black people where I'm at um, mm. and just as a historical site like where I teach um, where this uh, state of Maryland is one of the earliest colonial settlement and was yes. a very active site of, uh, of um, slave um, activity but there were a lot of tobacco plantations and a lot of uh, uh, people made to work in farms here so I would say all this have just uh, made me very sympathetic um, to what is going on. At the mm -hmm. same time, you know, on the flip side, that there is so much problems with um, all this education going around on, on diversity that makes people uh, more sensitive than they should be. So yeah. uh, there is a negative thing about all, all of this. It, makes people uh, find fault more easily with each other to a point that it's, it's not reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that creates more conflicts rather than space for honest discussion um, to move things forward or, or right. productive action. Yeah. Right. Wow. It's, it, it's, it must be interesting at least to be witnessing all this you know, but without having to, to really be involved in that decision-making process uh, as a foreigner in, in America. Um, I was wondering, you know, we, we read a lot about how in Singapore, okay, you briefly mentioned this before we started recording, but I, I, we, I want to talk about the public poll that labeled artists as non-essential. Um, I don't want to talk, ask you what, you know, what you think about the artists uh, being essential or not in, in the time of the pandemic because that's extremely indulgent. But I, I think it's interesting to like reflect on the role of, it, of an artist in, in times of crisis, I guess, yeah. I think artists all have social responsibility to speak up um, and to go against the grain and to challenge norms, mm -hmm. so in times of uh, crisis, um, that's what we have to do and what we should still do. Continue to make, you know, the, the less visible but very important things um, and bring them out to the forefront. Mm -hmm. and I feel like um, a lot of uh, social justice warriors, or, or people sharing things online, they have been influenced by artists. That's why they're doing that. I think that wow, there has been yeah. cultural movements in the past. Those memes that happened did, did not happen, uh, you know, without this kind of precedence. Yeah. Right. That's that is true. It's I'm gonna take all the credit <laughs> for. I mean, well deserved. Yes. Um, but I okay. I guess I have just one last question to wrap up. The, the interview um you know you you I, you talk a lot about visibility and i think that's really interesting because i i also see as an artist's role to to be like translators of of you know certain narratives or certain experiences um and with now that borders are closed and tightened because of the pandemic how do you see yourself um continuing on this on this creative process of making things that you care about visible and also like to, to sustain this cross-cultural sharing of um, our experiences? I think you really don't have much of a choice other than um, <laughs> online and remote, right? Um, yeah, I, if you have, uh, you know, better ideas, let me know. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, we, we are all, um, kind of just relying on the internet now. Yeah, I mean, if you, I guess physical borders uh, will, all, will really never, re will never really block out any dissemination of information anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really uh, tough time. And, um, you know, other than that, it might be more archaic ways. Like, um, I remember once in Chobi Mela, that really big uh, photography festival in Bangladesh, they plastered um, images on the outside of rickshaws. 
but the distribution wow. images and uh, this you know entire uh, rickshaw um, entire fleet of rickshaw would cycle around the city and given the traffic okay. condition in Bangladesh people had a very uh, long time to pause and stare at the images so, mm -hmm. so how about bringing uh, the artwork to people where it's accessible maybe we'll have more parking lot art shows outdoors yes have the roof of the f1 uh, building body where the <laughs> you know? yeah wow, I, I think you know, ideas will, will come out uh, you know we, we have very res resilient people in the arts industry and very resourceful yeah that's true i think uh, you know, you need to be pushed to, to really innovate. And this is, this, this pandemic has proved that people are not done creating and it's, it's really still ongoing. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I, I, do you have any closing statements? <laughs> no, I, I don't really have a closing statement, but I guess um, whoever's listening to this and, and to you, uh, Gwen and team at DAC, um, just want to wish you guys well. Very excited to see, um, you know, what DAC is going to transform into as, as uh, you know, our earlier conversation with Gwen uh, kind of off record um, has been uh, about all these exciting new changes and the recognition of how we really do need to um, change the way we work in, in mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, crisis and, and have the new world, the new world world. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Tristan. I, I enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, thank you for having me once again.